Hello everyone. Welcome to Rural Water Resource Management, Week 12, Lecture 5. In this week, we have been looking at the data that is needed for Rural Water Resource Management. <clears throat> we have looked at multiple data sets uh, ranging from hydrometeorological data like rainfall and then location of the recharge structures and also some other data on uh, government plants, um, uh, crop type, area, groundwater, everything we have been seeing. Now, what do we do with so much information? We need to process it into some kind of an algorithm so that we know what is the water available in the rural areas and what can be done about it. The one issue we have here is that the model that we developed using the budget, water budget equation may not hold always good. Why? Because the water budget is in one time stamp. Okay. For example, you write uh, your storage is equal to precipitation minus uh, soil moisture minus groundwater uh, discharge, etc. That is for one time stamp. But there is a need to automate it so that you have a longer time series of what is happening and where the water um, is going, right? Because just one time stamp won't be enough to do a successful management scenario. In that respect, there is a need for a model that can capture these uh, changes and then automate it behind in the model software uh, per day or per time stamp. Okay, so it collects the data, it evolves from one time stamp to another time stamp. Normally, it's a day, so from one day to the next day, and then it predicts or gives the output. Let's take what we have done so far. So data collection to water assessment. This is what we are aiming to do. We have collected a lot of data. Now we need to focus on the water assessment part. How do you do that? Data has been collected from different portals. So as I said, we use WRIS, we used remote sensing, ISRO, Bhuvan. Uh, we have seen uh, data from reports, uh, both NGO and public reports and government reports. In, in, in fact, there are there is some data from World Bank and other agencies also that can be put in. This data has to be converted to information. <coughs> so that is the lag. How do you convert numbers and values into information? Which is, how do you uh, get information from these kind of data? There is a conversion process involved because just numbers doesn't mean anything. Only when it becomes an information, it becomes useful for the policymakers, stakeholders, and general public. Let's take the first example of water mass balance budget approach. We use the water balance. However, uh, as I said, when you don't um, uh, automate it into an information, it does uh, of no value. All you get is plus minus uh, your budgets and then you get a net uh, storage. How is that storage changing? The change is very important. And how is that storage reacting to a good rainfall, to a good management scenario in the village is important. So most of the water balance approaches that we saw were Excel based. As I said, it doesn't uh, fit into a larger scale or a larger time series. So there is a need for hydrological models. And these hydrological models use the same data that you input in the Excel sheet or the water budget. Here, what happens is there is more sophisticated ways of integrating this data into information. Hydrological models can be complex and simple. So I'm just going to go through some definitions of a hydrological model. 
Okay, so it is basically what type of water balance does it use? What type of equations does it use? Is it a physically based model, which means it is driven by physics in terms of mass, energy conservation, uh, momentum, and um, uh, your uh, water coming in, going out, those kind of uh, analogies. Whereas your empirical models are models where it is based on statistical approach. For example, every uh, year we have rainfall in June in Maharashtra. So that we don't need a model to tell that the climate circulation is happening. Uh, so you'll get rainfall in June. This is based on statistics. The 100 years rainfall says you get rainfall in June and you do get rainfall in June. So based on these kind of methods of how the model is, at the end of the day, you want an information about the rainfall, how the rainfall converts into storage. So this, if it comes quickly through your um, empirical models, then you don't need a very complex uh, physical driven model. So it, it is based on your need and your location and data, what type of model you want. So hydrological models can be both <coughs> complex and simple based on the equations they use, based on the data they use. and one such uh, kind of semi-complex model, I would say, is SWOT, the Soil Water Assessment Tool, uh, which has been widely used globally. Everyone, every country has been using this model for their uh, government reports. Uh, and also in Indian applications, there are a lot of um, references to the SWOT model. In fact, the ministries of water and other uh, agencies do use uh, modeling tools and SWOT occupies a very dominant position in most agencies. Now what SWOT differs <coughs> from other models is first it is open source so you don't need to pay a lot of money to use it and learn it. Uh, there is no need of a special capacity built for SWOT because there are a lot of learners in the world and there is an as explicit forum where you could go and put a question and people will answer to it. So these all these resources are available at swat.tmau.edu. Uh, it is from uh, Texas A&M University in the US. So there is a model which has been supported widely in an academic development. So which means it will be very strong because they do evolve in academic institutions. The other aspect about SWAT, it is a um, kind of a semi lumped model, which means you take the area of interest and the SWOT model would break it into smaller components. Uh, for example, if you take a sub basin or a basin, it will break it into HRUs, hydrological response units. And within the hydrological response unit, the water balance equation holds the same. Okay, for example, when you have a different geology or a land cover, the hydrological balance would change. The infiltration rate will come down, the uh, percolation would be different, <laughs> the storage would be different, etc. But that requires a very uh, complex, more complex model. And sometimes that high level of accuracy is not necessary. So what you would do is you would use somewhere in the middle a model which can be free open source to learn and also has a high level of complexity uh, thereby letting you uh, understand the physically driven processes so it is a physically driven model uh, and it has different uh, routing mechanisms for water hydrology and etc uh, and it has its own limitations when it comes to data and groundwater etc it's not a groundwater model so it just does infiltration but what happens after the infiltration, it doesn't care. It just goes down or goes as base flow. It doesn't put it very accurately. The other part I would like to tell is that um, there is also an active uh, forum and uh, developers conference happening for SWAT. Uh, those who are interested can check the website and uh, learn it through these models and exercises. So the entire approach, what I said is uh, you have uh, uh, an Excel where you could put all these data that you collected and then estimate your net storage or change. Uh, and that could be cumbersome, that is not real time updating, etc. Whereas your models can be 
uh, run on real time and also it can quickly convert the data into an information and give decisions. In addition, SWOT has all the data you need to at least set up a model for Indian situation. All the data is kept at SWOT TMAU under the India data tab for India. So the, just for India, they have a very good data source, uh, including your uh, climate data, which is your rainfall, temperature, wind speed, etc., and your land use land cover data, etc. As I was saying, there is this uh, model is a, a very uh, sophisticated model in terms of it needs a lot of data. And sometimes if you don't give the data, it will have the default assumptions and those assumptions might kind of pull down your uh, result. So please understand that uh, it is also good to have a sophisticated model, but you need to give a lot of data rather than that you can have a simple model with less data so all this depends on your location and the availability of data so now i've showed you where to collect data but sometimes you also need more data for your models like swat for which you can get uh, from the government agencies in those times you just put it as a assumption in the model Let's see how the model is set up. As I said, you do have all your data on your left hand side, which is collected and kept in separate uh, folders or data bins. And then that is mixed into the SWOT database. So for example, you have your input data from your DEM, which is your digital elevation model, basically the elevation of the land. Uh, and that data can be taken as a remote sensing data as a raster, as an image, and that can go into the SWOT framework, which is here. Then you have your hydrography of um, the river discharge, which we already gave from WRIS, and the river networks, if you have, you can use it. Uh, the land use land cover can be taken from Bhuvan website I have mentioned, uh, or uh, your own uh, site, you could go and collect data for your um, region and then put it in as a good colorful map. Uh, then you have your soil database and weather stations. The soil uh, is, is, is very tricky um, system because um, not all um, high level soil maps are available. Uh, however, the course resolution is there in the FAO database and in the SWOT database that you could use. Uh, you could also take it from Bhuvan, uh, which has a kind of uh, similar scale uh, soil database. But throughout the world, people normally use the FAO harmonic uh, harmonized soil database, which has a combination of data to make these um, uh, soil databases. Then you have the weather stations, the location XY of the weather station, and the parameters like temperature, rainfall, humidity, wind speed. There's a lot of data on, the, on these um, hydrological parameters, uh, weather stations that is needed in a long time series. So what is a minimum um, uh, time step of daily, and then it can do monthly, annual, etc. So you cannot capture the sub daily events. For example, you have a flood and the flood happens only in one or two hours. Uh, you cannot capture that in uh, SWOT. It can be accumulated as a per day rainfall and then per day flood, not as a sub daily uh, level. So that is the only time scale issue that the SWOT has. Otherwise, it has been widely used in many countries. So then we have the other processes that run in the SWOT, which actually, as I said, it takes the watershed boundary, uh, it defines the boundary. So we had a class where we made sure we um, drew the watershed boundary uh, here in this model setup, it will do it for you. It will just do the uh, watershed boundary based on the elevation data you gave and also based on the outlet point you are interested in. Next, it goes to the definition of the sub basins and the small units, which is called HRU, and then the weather data is actually mixed to it. <coughs> and then the databases are used. Calibrations are run, the model is rerun after validation and calibration. And at, at, at last, you get the output tables and charts. 
So the output tables come uh, as a chart, as I said, in Excel format down, you could see it, but then you need to convert it into maps and um, other information visuals um, on a GIS uh, platform or a very sophisticated mapping platform. So I'm going to show you some results and tell you how, walk you through uh, how this helps in um, accumulating data and then rural development for water. So the first uh, thing I would like to show you is a, a study in the Kali Pandaki Basin in Nepal, uh, where you see the land use land cover has been made at a very high resolution. This is your satellite data, ground data, which has been useful for the mapping. And that is an input data, right? Now, then the sub bases are being created, the HRUs are being created by the SWOT model. You don't have to give these boundaries, it will make it based on the elevations and where the stream emerges or starts and then where it joins the other stream. So you could see here all the uh, small sub bases will have a small, small uh, river network uh, coming and so which means that each one is on by its own a basin, but when it is in a bigger framework, it becomes a sub basin in a bigger framework. So all these sub basins will have to drain and then bring the water down to the outlet point, which is in the south. The north, the water uh, comes, uh, the, the streams start to emerge, and then the time of concentration, rainfall, moving into runoff, and then comes down as discharge. So again, if you could see that each one sub basin, you do an Excel uh, water balance equation. But can you do that for every um, uh, you know uh, location? Is the question, which is not possible, right? So you cannot do one equation here, one equation here, one equation here on Excel or a table, and then give the output. So for that, you need a sophisticated model like SWOT. So what it does is SWOT would take this uh, water, uh, this sub basin. Uh, and then rainfall is occurring, it converts it to runoff and puts it into the river stream network, you could see here. Now this stream uh, number two basin did not have any other sub basin giving water into it. Okay, so the, the issues are very less. It's a very straightforward, no Q in, no G in, it just does the model. But now two would lead into number seven, correct? So number two or okay, let's take 45 because it's bigger to see so 45 doesn't have any other water coming into the uh, sub basin however whatever water is created into the streams push into the streams at sub basin 45 is going to go to 49 and then 49 goes to 50 and then it goes on and on so this cannot be captured on a hand or a excel model you need a very sophisticated model that captures, waits for that river to come, understands at time zero where the water is located and time T1, how much water is moving across the basin. So with this uh, kind of understanding and analogy, at the end you get uh, a sub basin water yield map. Okay, so water yield is the net water that comes out of these locations, uh, so sub basins uh, uh, annually or monthly, however you have done it. As I said, it comes as a daily time step. Now the daily time step is converted to monthly or annual based on you in the tables and charts that the output gives. Okay, so this is very similar to any other model. What I'm trying to say here is uh, you need a model to do these exercises uh, and the model outputs would vary depending on the model, uh, but you could use uh, the output to get more information uh, based on your research questions. Look at this example. You could see that even though rainfall happens across this sub basin and uh, the whole area, some areas get more yield. And that could be because of less groundwater recharge, more water coming in or more flashy floods. Suppose rainfall is the same across the basin. Then why is the uh, these sub basins 55, number 55, 66 getting more water yield? 
and that could be because of the slopey nature or less water uh, ex extraction, less water losses, no ET, less ET or groundwater recharge. So you see how we could make these connections come through. The other connections that come through is these smaller basins would yield to a larger basin because the water comes in. Uh, when you are here, there is no water from the outer basin coming inside because it is a locked system. A watershed boundary is already there. But within the watershed, you have sub basins contributing between each other. And that helps in increasing the water yield in the downstream locations. Let's look. So now we have done the basic baseline, baseline scenario, how much water is there and how it's distributed across the sub basins. Now, once you know one baseline here, you can run scenarios. Okay, so that is the beauty of models. Once you set up a model to capture the current scenario, you can use the same model to add different scenarios and visions. But one scenario is for sure the climate change. Uh, if I know five years later, this is the rainfall I'm going to get, I can put that rainfall in the model today and understand how the yield will be distributed and also the land use land cover. So let's take one example like that um, before we uh, close this uh, class. Uh, we have, uh, for example, the Koshi Basin, which I've been telling that it's a transboundary basin, which starts somewhere in uh, Tibet, China, flows through Nepal, and then comes down to uh, India and feeds into the Ganges Basin. Koshi is one of the biggest contributors of uh, water to the Ganges Basin. And you could see here that the land use land cover is forest grasslands on the northern part with some uh, snow and ice, uh, the Himalayan uh, range. And then down it's a lot of agriculture, which is the Indian side. Uh, slopey land is less, more fertile plains are there, the alluvium has been deposited. Uh, and this plain gets more agricultural activities. So what has we have done is once you set up the baseline model, uh, we were able to look at the annual average annual water demand. So uh, once the water yield is put, now I could put the di different demands that is inside the basin. So one could be agricultural demand, domestic demand, industrial demand, etc. So once you put that demand, um, you could actually visualize where the whole activities are happening. For example, you could look at the first image I will go back to the first image again. You see here is where agriculture is happening. Here is just forest and grasslands and snow. So most of the ground water or rural water uptake is going to happen here or demand is going to happen here. And that is well captured in this location. Within that location, you do have some less demands and that could be because of the variations in cultivation of crops and or the variation in land holding the water. For example, if there's a big flow coming into these smaller uh, locations, mostly you are not going to do any agriculture inside the river, only around the river you will do, right? So those lands are given up saying that it's not, you cannot do any agriculture, uh, but near the river, there's a lot of land that is used for agricultural activities. So now you could see a good understanding of these green, light green represents agriculture, and that also represents red in the annual water demand. So now we have run the model. We have taken the water yield per sub basin. So now the only thing to do is, you know how much water is coming, you know what the water demand is, are they meeting each other? If they meet each other, then the unmet demand is zero, which is green color, zero to eight, which means I do have uh, water coming into the basin through rainfall and water yield, and I know there is a water demand. If the demand and the water yield cancel each other, then it is a healthy basin, you are good, like in terms of water managing. But that is not the case. Mostly it is negative, which means you are using or demanding more than the actual water available, at least surface water. So we are dealing about this as only surface water. 
but then uh, once the demand is high and the supply is low what do you do you look for other supplies to augment your demand for example you have a demand of um, uh, petrol right so nowadays you do see that petrol is mixed with uh, other additives uh, to increase the volume and and uh, the demand is high and so what you do is you cannot just say people use less you'll have to uh, match their consumption in the in the industrial sectors so for that they have given a mixture of um, uh, petrol <coughs> which can be <laughs> used for transportation so here that is the understanding here so if i know the water yield and a lot of water is lost out of the system and i know that there is a region where there is a water demand scenario unmet demand then i could save the water and then reroute it to this region for example if there's excess water in the central and the uh, southern regions here you could and here also right so you could save that water route it back to this red zones where the unmet demand is high um, which means uh, they need the water, the industry is set up. However, the demand is not met because the water is not available. So these are typically the scenarios that you could work with only if you set up the model and do these calculations. Uh, and you could be creative on these calculations and explore more and more of these model intricacies because a lot of models are being developed. Uh, however, uh, have they been validated on the ground is a question. So you need to validate it on the ground, use it well. So SWOT has been uh, multiple times used in Indian scenarios. And then finally, you know where to put your uh, recharge structures, check dams, uh, large dams, etc. So now, as I said, you have unmet demand downstream. There's no point of stopping the water in the downstream location, but upstream where the yield is high, excess water is there only when there's excess you have less demand right demand is always met so hopefully the other regions have excess water and they are storing with you uh, through um, the canals because gravity is there or pump uh, transfer which a lot of uh, southern states have also looked at in india like which means you supply energy and then uh, transport water one from one end to the other all these are good uh, scenarios that can help, especially the investment uh, side of the government, where they can invest and bring people in uh, to uh, put these systems in place. And also, most importantly, it, it, it gives a clarity of where the water flows and how it flows for uh, development so that it can be used for development. So we are coming uh, to the close of this wonderful NPTEL uh, course on rural water resource management. I really hope you had uh, enjoyed this um, course as much as I enjoyed presenting it. Uh, and um, I hope I have been able to sensitize you on the, the rural water issues um, and what are the ways out. So mostly we discussed about uh, hydrological parameters, uh, what makes the rural water system and where is the data, etc. We looked at rural water issues, why rural India is facing so much water issues, uh, and then which led to the different management scenarios, both nature based and engineering based, uh, and different different scenarios where you could actually slow down the water and use it within your villages and stuff. Uh, then in the last two weeks, we were extensively focusing on the data for rural uh, water assessments. And as I said, a lot of people um, have uh, come to a stage to talk about rural water development, but the data is lacking. So that should not happen to you. And that is where I made sure I would spend two weeks on the data collection and showing the data portals. Once you have the data, you can establish your water budgets. And since the water budgets may not be able to automate uh, by itself or uh, have a full uh, vision of the watershed holistic uh, you know linking everything into the watershed you need models and models can do that work for you all you have to do is give the data make sure the model is correctly validated and evaluated 
before it uh, runs fully into the system. So all these topics we uh, checked through and in the data section, we carefully pick only the major data that you would need. Uh, however, there are other data that could be possible um, or could be needed based on the model you select. In those kind of scenarios, I would recommend you to um, read some papers that have used these models and where they got the data. Mostly they'll give the data. If it is a private uh, data collection, which is, means that they collected the data, they use the data, it might be hard to get the data, but I, I've taught you how to use a report to cite it uh, and then um, use the data indirectly. And the models, there are a lot of um, uh, costly models, there are a lot of <coughs> open source models, so you are free to choose whatever model you would like. Uh, and work on it for sustainable rural water development and rural water resource management. So I hope this course led to a better understanding because um, you, the key is understanding these concepts, understanding the water balance, where the water goes, why it flows in a particular way. Uh, and I hope that better understanding uh, leads uh, to a better monitoring and management situation uh, because a lot of uh, these um, monitoring and evaluation is not available, uh, but a lot of structures have been built without knowing if they work, right? So there's a lot of money and stuff. So it's better to understand the rural issues, understand the science behind the rural water issues and then um, uh, work on better management and monitoring solutions. This would lead a, a, a new wave of sustainable use of water, uh, which is very much needed for the coming years because with climate change and ever increasing population, uh, we are in the <coughs> great need to manage water and save as much as water you, we can. With this note, I would like to thank everyone for coming to my course. Uh, I hope to see you in the future courses uh, and um, hope all of you uh, do well in the exam. Thank you. Namaste.